I just want to tell you I'm delighted to be back again. Dr. Ramsberg and I are looking forward to completing during this sequence what we started in patients and populations. And at the end of this sequence, you'll have your basic education in general pathology. <coughs> Missing something, Lou? Yeah, I think you're okay. What is this? Pointer. You can't have it. You can't have it. Uh, one housekeeping point, just so there's no confusion, unlike patients and populations where you had to pass pathology as a separate entity, our questions just get mixed in with a whole bunch. So uh, don't look for a separate grade. We'll know how you're doing separately, but uh, it'll all be figured in. Now, what we're going to do for you, or to you in the next uh, five lectures, is basically uh, this set of topics and uh, what they share in common, that they all represent abnormalities in the movement of fluids in the body. Basically, screw-ups of what Dr. DeLacy was talking about during the last hour. And there are various ways of uh, screwing things up, as you can imagine from that list of titles. Now, what we want to do with each one of these is, first of all, talk a little bit about the mechanisms show you some of the tissue changes that occur because of these perturbations of, of, of circulation, and try to translate these to the really important part for you, namely, how does this manifest itself in your patients? How do you recognize it? What is the significance? And so forth. So we'll try to do that for <clears throat> each of these uh, entities. And I think I'll just uh, jump right into the, uh, the first one, and I, I hope we'll do this in a logical order as we've laid it out here. The very first uh, thing we want to talk about in the way of derangements is something that we call uh, congestion. Now, congestion, very simple. We say something is congested, there's too much blood in the particular area. That's all it means. Uh, it's a word that gets all uh, misused sometimes, particularly these days. Winter's coming and you'll see the ads on television uh, for uh, relieving congestion here and there. I mean, I don't know what a congested chest is, uh, uh, but uh, it, it gets used very generally like that. But specifically what we mean when we talk about congestion is too much blood in an area and it's blood within the cardiovascular system. That's important. In other words, uh, the vessels in a particular area that we call congested are dilated, distended, chock full of blood. I mean, they're always full, but they're really distended uh, with blood. And this is very, very different than hemorrhage, which is defined simply, and we'll do, deal with that next period, but it's defined as, as escape of blood from the cardiovascular system. And when I say escape, it can escape on a floor or it can escape entirely within the tissues. But as long as outside of the cardiovascular system, that's hemorrhage. Within the cardiovascular system, it's overfilling. That is uh, congestion. Now, a couple of ways to uh, achieve a congested state. And in very general terms, one way is to flow more blood into the area. And as you are well aware now from, from uh, other uh, sources, the, the way that happens is with arteriolar dilatation. The arterioles are kind of like the valves controlling things. Dilate the arterioles so enough blood flows into the capillary bed so it can't quite as comfortably get out the venous end and the capillaries dilate. And that we call active congestion or active hyperemia. The word hyperemia, mean, hyper means too much, emia, blood. Congestion and hyperemia are sometimes used interchangeably. So you talk about act, active congestion or active hyperemia, increased flow into the area. You can also cause congestion by decreasing the outflow. In other words, if something impairs how much or how rapidly things drain through the venous side of the circulation, with the same arteriolar inflow, you're going to get distension of the capillary bed. And that we would call passive congestion. Now, the terminology gets a little bit goofed up. Uh, the authors of your text, and this is all right, they refer to what I would call active congestion. They call it simply hyperemia. 
And instead of going to the length of calling it passive congestion, they call it congestion. So they talk about hyperemia on the one hand, congestion on the other hand. But just so you understand, they both represent distension of the microcirculation, one because of too much inflow, the other because of too little uh, outflow. Now, a prime example, let's, let's back up, an example of active congestion uh, is the hyperemia or the congestion that is associated with the acute inflammatory reaction. In other words, the rubor, the redness of the acute inflammatory, sorry, The uh, rubor of the acute inflammatory reaction is active hyperemia or, or active uh, congestion. Uh, and you know that it really is redness. And uh, when we talk about a redness of the skin, we talk about erythema. So when it's active congestion, you're pouring more blood in there, it tends to be a little bit redder. Another example of a uh, more physiologic example of, of hyperemia is what you've heard about in, in physiology lectures, is when a muscle, for instance, is, is working actively, gradually the flow increases. In other words, there's vasodilatation and you get more blood flowing in for, uh, to meet obvious needs and so forth. And that's purely physiologic. So there's a hyperemia associated with exercise. A trivial example I always like to point out is a blush. You know, someone flips the light switch on when you'd rather that hadn't happened. <laughs> and and if, you're, if you're light skinned, pretty soon you've got a very flaming set of cheeks. Uh, that's a little bit of a neurogenic, and the arterioles dilate, and, and, and there it is. And that's because of more blood actively flowing in. Now, what about uh, passive congestion? Uh, this is, uh, as I said, basically due to something impeding the venous outflow. And the obvious way this can happen uh, is, uh, for instance, with a clot in a vein. <laughs> if you put a clot in, in, in the, the, the sewer system, things are going to get plugged up and there's going to be uh, distension of the uh, capillaries behind it. Uh, another example is a tourniquet or Dr. DeLacy's example of the blood pressure cuff on there, where you're impairing venous return and, and you get passive uh, congestion. A rubber band around the finger. You've all probably filled with this in an odd moment. You wrap a rubber band around your finger, pretty soon the tip of your finger is turning purple. That's a lot of passive congestion, and you get this purplish color, sometimes we call cyanosis. It's a bit of a, of a bluing uh, of the color. Now, whether it's active congestion or passive congestion, if you look at the capillary bed, the morphology is going to be the same. What's going to happen is instead of seeing some of the capillaries empty, they're all going to be full. Instead of seeing the capillaries this big around, they're going to be that big around. So you're going to have in every cubic centimeter of tissue, you're going to have more blood simply because of engorged vessels. And we'll show you, uh, well, this simply uh, recaps what I've said. Active congestion is an increase coming in on this side. Passive congestion is a decrease in outflow on this side. And I'll show you an example. Here's an autopsy room view of a fairly normal lung. Uh, the blackish here is all the soot you're breathing in right now as we speak. Uh, we all have. Uh, some of that, but notice the, the color is very from a, oh, a light pinkish tan to, to a pink, and that's because of the blood uh, within the uh, tissues. Now, if we have a lung that is congested, and I'll show you a really four plus example, rather than looking like this, it looks like that. And that lung, instead of weighing, I don't know, 250, 300 grams, probably weighs six or 700 grams because of that excess blood, and you see what it does to the color. Microscopically, the counterparts are something like this. Here's lung, you're, you're more or less familiar with, with this. Uh, the, all of the air spaces and the alveolar 
uh, walls are just, just tangles of capillaries, and you really can't sense at this magnification uh, too, much red blood cell, too many red blood cells in there. They're small, and that's it. That's more or less normal as we see it on a typical slide. From that purplish lung, looks like that. And it's just the, every vessel is distended with blood, and that's a very, very congested uh, lung. Now, don't fret about this. Microscopically, it's a little subtle, unless you're very accustomed to looking at slides, which you're not. Uh, grossly, it's much easier. I mean, like, think of the blush again. Uh, it's very easy to tell when a tissue <coughs> is uh, congested. Now, Whatever the cause, if uh, congestion is short-lived, it doesn't do anything to the tissues. I mean, you can imagine if, if something uh, corrected, let's say, the drainage defect here, the blood would simply flow out a little faster. It would equilibrate back. The, the capillaries would shrink back down, and the tissue would be uh, just uh, the way it started. And, and it would be basically a trivial thing as far as the, the uh, long-term <clears throat> effects on the tissue. It's only when congestion drags on and on and on uh, that you can get some permanent alteration in the tissues. Active congestion or hyperemia by its nature is short-lived. You know, you have an inflammatory reaction for a few days and things go back to normal. So we don't uh, worry uh, too much about permanent tissue changes. Passive congestion, on the other hand, can be short-lived and we'll, we'll get into some of the causes. Or it can go on for months or even years. And when that happens, the tissues are going to suffer. There's going to be problems with chronic uh, uh, hypoxia in the tissues. There's going to be a problem with uh, blood and blood breakdown products. And you usually end up with a degree of fibrosis in the tissue as well. So uh, passive congestion is, is potentially much more serious. Now what about, let's just talk about passive congestion in general. The causes, again, can be local, such as a clot in a vein, such as something pressing on the vein. Uh, could be a tumor or something like that, or just something happier, a pregnant uterus settling down on the pelvic veins will cause a certain amount of, of, of congestion of the, the dependent tissues. These are local causes. Now, there are many central causes of, of uh, passive congestion, that is, non-local, and they're related to deficiencies in the pumping action of the heart. Uh, you, you know what the heart is supposed to be doing, and uh, when uh, the heart uh, begins to fail, there's a very complex syndrome, which we're going to be talking about next week in particular, uh, called congestive heart failure. Um, but what, what it amounts to is that uh, if the, the heart can't handle what's coming to it and can't push out the blood the way it should, uh, we, we say it is, it is failing. Now, for purposes of our discussion this morning, we keep it simple. I simply tell you that if the left ventricle begins to poop out, I don't mean it stops, but it's, it's beginning to falter for one reason or another, so it can't handle the load of blood coming to it from the lungs, the lungs are going to get backed up. So as the left heart begins to fail, you get back pressure and, and, and passive congestion uh, in the lungs. Now this is important. You're going to confront this uh, constantly, and, and what sorts of things would, would produce this? Now, we're going to detail them at another time, but, but just think about this, that uh, if the left ventricle is working against an impossibly heavy load, as it is with, let's say, untreated severe hypertension, every time the poor old left ventricle beats, it's got to push against that head of pressure, uh, it will eventually poop out. Uh, if the myocardium itself is abnormal, and we will detail this next week during an MDC, but various abnormalities of the myocardium, such as ischemic necrosis, will cause it to poop out and will produce passive congestion of the lungs. Um, valve abnormalities. Think of a mitral valve being stenotic and scarred so that the blood can't get through it as it should going to be passive congestion uh, of the lungs.
Now, when you get to the right side of the heart, it's a little bit different. All of the blood from the body is returning to the right side of the heart, and as it begins to falter and not, not able to handle what's coming to it, there is back pressure really throughout uh, the, the body, and it affects many, many tissues. Does that make, make sense now? Cardiac failure can be very acute. In other words, let's say a person uh, occludes a coronary artery, has an area of, of, of dead myocardium in that ventricle within minutes to hours, very easily, that ventricle can begin to falter. So there's such a thing as very acute passive congestion of the lungs. And I'll show you one such case. Here is this, uh, I don't remember the exact details, but basically this was very acute left ventricular failure. It didn't stop, but it, it, it just couldn't handle the blood coming to it, and the patient died relatively soon. What you see is a very high power view here, where you're looking at air spaces and very, very distended capillaries in all of the alveolar walls. That happens, as I say, within a matter of minutes, uh, certainly hours easily, but even within minutes, because there's no tissue pressure here. The, the, the pulmonary capillaries are sort of floating in air. So when there's back pressure, they really get engorged. And you'll notice that there are numbers of red cells out here in the air spaces. They have been pushed out passively. In other words, with this very delicate capillary network and this tremendous increase in hydrostatic pressure because of the passive congestion, these red cells get forced out. And this is sometimes referred to as hemorrhage by diapedesis. That's a misnomer. You remember Ramsberg with his diapedesis. The red cells don't do that. They just get pushed out there. But this is an important point. And a patient with acutely congested lungs will actually cough up a little bit of uh, pink-tinged uh, stuff. So that can happen very, very acutely. But on the other hand, Many examples of cardiac failure, many, many, there are hundreds of thousands of people running around the country, uh, limping around the country uh, <laughs> at any time who are in chronic heart failure, and they will have chronic congestion of various organs, and that's where things begin to change and you begin to get some permanent changes. And I'll track this first through the lungs and then I'll show you the, what happens in the liver. Now. These red cells, let's say the, the patient has a, a lung which is congested, maybe not quite this badly congested, but congested uh, because of, of a left ventricular problem, and it goes on for some weeks even or, or even months. These red cells don't survive out here in the air spaces. They break down and <clears throat> alveolar macrophages, which you know about, come out and scarf these red cells up. And here's a slightly later picture of a different patient. Again, you see the engorged capillaries, hemorrhage by diapedesis. And what's different here is that these alveolar macrophages are beginning to scarf up the breaking down red cells. You can see a little bit of pink in the cytoplasm of that one, perhaps that one up here. And what these macrophages do when they ingest these, these hunks of hemoglobin is they degrade the hemoglobin and uh, what you come to see within a, a number of days and certainly weeks is the breakdown products of the hemoglobin, mainly a substance we call hemosiderin, which you've probably heard about before. But if we went back a little bit later, a few days or weeks later in a lung like this, instead of seeing just the red cells and fragments within these uh, macrophages, we see something like this. And here again, you've got the congested alveolar uh, capillaries. And out in the air spaces now, these macrophages that have scarfed up the, the red cells are uh, storing the breakdown products, the iron-containing moiety at least. Uh, it's related to ferritin, but we call that hemosiderin. And uh, that is not a stain. That's, that's, that's not the stain. That's the actual color of those cells. They're brown. And uh, a patient, uh, again, uh, who is in chronic <coughs> left ventricular failure, who coughs some of these up in the sputum, you can see them in the sputum smear, uh, they've been called for generations, they've been called heart failure cells. 
for obvious reasons. When the heart fails, particularly the left side, you get cells like that accumulating in the lung. It gets even more and more marked as the congestion becomes uh, longer and longer. I mean, we can, we can look at this and say this isn't, this isn't acute. This is, isn't something that happened in the emergency room. This is sort of early chronic. I don't want to put a calendar date on it. But as it goes on for the weeks and months, you get more and more iron-containing cells accumulated, uh, and you will get fibrosis gradually in the uh, alveolar walls. That's a more complex Re reason for that, but, but you will get fibrosis and more and more iron. So there is an example of very advanced chronic passive congestion. It barely looks like lung anymore. Uh, the hemosiderin contain containing uh, heart failure cells are out in the air spaces, and the, the alveolar walls are thickened and getting fibrotic. We used to see these uh, to the point where uh, the lungs were leathery, we'd call them indurated, very leathery and brown grossly. So in the autopsy room, you see a stiff brown lung as a result of chronic passive congestion because of chronic left ventricular failure. Now, the, this is an important concept. When the left ventricle fails, the right ventricle is going to fail also. I mean, it's a closed system. It's got to be that way. In other words, as things back up in the lung, there's passive congestion in the lung, the right heart is pushing against a bigger load and is going to give out eventually. And the usual cause of right ventricular failure is left ventricular failure. They fail together. But now when the right ventricle fails, it's going to be reflected systemically. In other words, blood from all over the body isn't getting back the way it should. The central venous pressure goes up. The patient will experience, and you'll be able to pick this up on physical, distension of the neck veins. That's a pretty good sign. And since a lot of blood is coming through the liver, the liver is going to suffer. In other words, the liver has got to dump its blood into the inferior vena cava and on up, and there's back pressure there. The liver begins to get enlarged and engorged with blood. In fact, patients will complain of tenderness in the right upper quadrant because of a stretch on the hepatic capsule. It's, it's that engorged. And uh, I will show you some very interesting things that, that happen within the liver. Now, you've not studied liver histology yet, but you're all experts from last August uh, in this. This is a, uh, roughly a, a lobule of the liver, and there are millions and millions of lobules making up the liver. And I just want to uh, remind you of what we told you about the blood flow, that the blood flow starts basically from the periphery of the lobule here, and these are the sinusoids or specialized capillaries that carry the blood towards this central vein. Now the blood is pretty much drained out of this. I, I picked this uh, section because it shows you the sinusoids very well. These central veins go into the inferior vena cava and then up to the heart. So that when there's passive congestion on the liver, you would expect the pressure to go up here and to be reflected back into these sinusoids and produce sinusoidal distension. And that's exactly what happens. Now, in an acutely congested liver, you just see these sinusoids en engorged with blood. But in a liver that remains congested, you start getting some permanent changes. Now, here's a lower power view. That's a single lobule there. It's another lobule over here, probably another one up here. And you'll notice something interesting. Again, I, I've drained the blood out of this to show you, but the blood is entering this lobule along the periphery here and flowing towards the central vein. And this, is, this liver has been congested for a while, chronically congested. We've drained the blood out of it. But what you see is there's distension of these sinusoids towards the center. Not so much towards the periphery where the blood is coming in, but this is uh, closer to the back pressure from the heart. These sinusoids are distended, and the hepatocytes are smaller there. They've undergone a certain degree of atrophy with all of this. And I'll show you this now with the blood, uh, higher power with the blood still in there. Here is the... Uh, center of the lobule down here, the periphery of the lobule up here, and you see the little tiny hepatocytes. They're really shriveling up and distended sinusoids full of blood there. Here it is at even a higher power. 
normal size hepatocytes out here and towards the central vein you see how they've undergone atrophy and there's been tremendous dissension of the sinusoids. That's outflow obstruction basically. You could, if, you, if something obstructed the inferior vena cava just above the liver, it would produce the same thing. Failing right heart produces the same thing. But there's an interesting point that's got to be made here is that as the heart is failing, right and left ventricle, but as they're failing, not only is there passive congestion sort of looking backwards, but the left ventricle isn't putting out blood sufficiently to perfuse all tissues the way it should. Now, having said that, this is patient is in both right and left ventricular failure, and the blood from the left ventricle, uh, the arterial blood, is also coming in here through these sinusoids, and this is the area furthest from the blood supply. And when that cardiac output drops low enough and the blood supply is bad enough here, these cells simply undergo necrosis. They're, they're basically dying off because of ischemic necrosis, and you get this sort of thing. This is in very, very severe heart failure where uh, the central cells here, instead of just being atrophic, they are atrophic, but they are dead. You don't see any nuclei in there, and because the area is congested, it becomes very, very hemorrhagic. So the whole central area of that lobule is a big hemorrhagic necrotic mess. And here it is under a lower power now, just to give you the idea of how it's a repetitive pattern. You can see many lobules on here, and the center of each lobule is necrotic and hemorrhagic. When you see that pattern, now it ought to be up there in your cortex already, when you see that pattern, think of heart failure. It makes perfect sense. The liver is getting a double whammy. It's con congested because of the right heart failure, and it's ischemic because of the poor left ventricular outflow. How does that translate to a gross appearance? There it is. This is actually a cut surface of, of such a liver and with severe heart failure. In the center area of each lobule is just this hemorrhagic mess, and the periphery is more normal, and it's repeated thousands of times across the liver with, with that many lobules. And you see a liver like that, and you say, that patient's prob probably, and there are a few other things that do this, but the patient's most likely got heart failure. And this has got a food name, has to. And uh, the, the old Germans thought this looked like a nutmeg. Now, most of you think of nutmeg as a brown powder on top of an eggnog. But uh, there is a real nutmeg, which I cut on a bandsaw to show you. And a nutmeg liver over here. Uh, they don't look alike, but it's one of our traditions. So when someone says nutmeg liver, you better think of uh, this, this sort of thing, uh, most likely uh, from heart failure. Now, there are parallel changes in other organs. Uh, I mean, you can see similar changes in the spleen uh, with, with advanced heart failure, but, but the uh, lungs, liver, and spleen are the, the good examples of, of uh, some of these changes. I want to mention one other effect of, of passive congestion that deals with chronic distension of veins. Uh, and, and Dr. DeLacy mentioned, you know, standing up all day long, and there's this basically standpipe of blood from the level of the heart all the way down. So vein, the veins in the extremities tend to be congested. Now, what sometimes happens is the valves give a little bit. That makes it even worse. There are probably some genetic factors here. Add in such things as pregnancy, which also can uh, distend those veins. And the point is when veins remain distended for a chronic length of time, some permanent changes occur. They get distended, they get thick-walled, they get tortuous because they're also stretching this way and, and if one end is fixed here, one end is fixed here, and they're stretching, you're going to get a, a wiggly vein. When you know what I'm describing is varicose veins. You've all heard of those. Another term, uh, uh, which I prefer, is varices, 
and the singular is varix, V-A-R-I-X. It's a tortuous, dilated, fibrotic, distended vein. And uh, you're familiar with, uh, with these, uh, I'm sure. And if I said varicose veins, you'd think first of uh, legs. And that's probably where they're, they were, where they're commonest. Uh, another homely example of varicosities or varices is hemorrhoids. It's just the hemorrhoidal plexus of veins around the anus that gets distended and tortuous and, and, and so forth. Uh, and there's one, a much more serious example of hemorrhoids, and, uh, of varices. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Obvious. Uh, and that is varices of the esophagus. And I want to digress here just for a moment because this is an important subject. And basically here, this is a cartoon of netters. You can see what varices look like. They're dilated veins, irregularly dilated, tortuous, elongated, and a whole plexus of these esophageal varices. Well, uh, the next question is, why should these form? This is not just a postural thing in the, in the esophagus. That doesn't, doesn't make any sense. And the answer lies in something that you haven't studied specifically yet, but you will. You haven't done the abdomen yet in gross, have you? Don't worry about the details of this. This is just to, to remind you or to introduce the idea that the venous drainage of the basically the whole GI tract, pancreas, spleen, and the GI tract, the venous drainage goes up towards the liver, eventually uniting in something we call the portal vein. And the portal venous blood enters the liver, flows through all those sinusoids, this is along with arterial blood, flows in there, and then has to empty out into the inferior vena cava and on up. If something should occlude or impede the flow of portal venous blood through the liver, the pressure is going to go up in this portal venous system, and we call that portal venous hypertension. Now, one of the things that happens is there's a back pressure. Every vessel in, in this drainage bed gets distended, and now we're in the stomach and esophagus. Here's the esophagus coming down to the stomach. This is about the level of the diaphragm here. And what happens is collateral channels open up, and this immense portal venous pressure is transmitted through these vessels along to vessels in the base of the esophagus which normally aren't that big, and voila, you have esophageal varices. Now, something, uh, if I ask you, well, okay, what, what would produce this? Uh, a thrombus in the portal vein occasionally occurs, and that will certainly produce it. If you get a thrombus there, it's gonna, the blood is going to try and get back any way it can, and it'll open up these esophageal veins and produce varices. Much more commonly, it is a process of end-stage necrosis and inflammation in the liver, something we call cirrhosis. You've all heard that word. And cirrhosis is a g generic term for the kind of diffuse scarring, end-stage liver. A number of things can cause it, but what you end up with is a liver that looks like that. And what you're looking at is nodules of, of hepatic parenchyma with a very screwed up architecture and, and lots and lots of scar in that liver. And without going into detail, you can imagine that the portal blood flowing in there is going to have a hell of a time getting through, relatively speaking. So the commonest cause, it's almost always the cause of esophageal varices, is cirrhosis of the liver. Keep that in mind. Now. There's the actual picture. This is an autopsy room picture of varices. Here is the esophagus coming down. Here's the stomach here. The diaphragm would have been about here. And look at that varix. Isn't that awful? There's another. Well, these are all varices. They're all much too large here. And that one is, is gigantic. This has no cosmetic significance, as it might in the legs. You know, Even your significant other wouldn't know that you had esophageal varices. Uh, but the problem is that there's pressure in these varices, for reasons I've, I've mentioned, 
And if all you need is a little mucosal erosion over the surface of that, here's a, actually I've cut through, this is another esophagus, I've cut through it so you can see in profile, just a little bit of mucosa covering this huge varix. And when you get an erosion and a, even a pinpoint opening in one of these varices, it bleeds like a fountain. And at first the patient will swallow the blood but then that causes vomiting very quickly. Blood is irritating in the stomach and we have what we call hematemesis, emesis of blood. And uh, it's, it's a, a very devastating sort of thing. There, there are ways around this now, hopefully, if, if it's recognized early enough, but uh, that used to be a major, major cause of mortality in uh, cirrhotics and it still is a very uh, significant uh, problem. Okay, so much for congestion. In the remaining few minutes, uh, I want to talk about uh, a derangement that follows logically, and that is edema. You've all heard the word, and edema is nothing more or less than an accumulation of too much fluid in the interstitium of the body, the interstitial spaces, or the body cavities. That's edema. Now you'll hear some other words used, and your patients will use them sometimes. Sometimes they talk about high drops, hydro meaning water, or dropsy. That's an old, old term, but some patients will still come in and say, Doc, I had the dropsy, or something like that. Uh, it's it's uh, edema. Now, some other terms you've got to learn. When the uh, fluid accumulates in a body cavity, we talk about an effusion so that if you have uh, fluid accumulating in the pleural cavity, it's a pleural effusion. Pericardium, it's a pericardial effusion. This is a, a sort of a, a curveball. In the peritoneum, we rarely speak of peritoneal effusion. We speak of ascites. Got to know that word. Uh, another word that, that gets kicked around, and you've got to know it, is anasarca, and that's generalized edema. You have a patient who comes in sort of puffy everywhere, got edema in the lower extremities, got pleural effusions, maybe some ascites, waterlogged totally, that is anasarca. So, so know those uh, words. Now, why edema? Well, I'll give you a very simple-minded view of what Dr. DeLacy uh, t talked about in the last period, and that's why I was crouched in the corner there. I wanted to hear what he did because it's, uh, I don't have to waste much time on it. Uh, but basically, when you think about what makes, I'm not going to give you figures or, or fine details like, like he did, uh, I think much more crudely, but basically uh, you've got blood flowing into the microcirculation and there's a certain head of hydrostatic pressure which tends to force fluid out of the vessels. There's a certain osmotic balance, largely because if you've got plasma proteins staying within the microcirculation and that in effect, I don't want to say it this way really, but sucks blood in, keep, uh, it keeps fluid in rather. And uh, you've got a certain amount of pressure at the venous end as well. And normally, there is a certain amount of flow of blood from the vascular system into the interstitium, which is carried away by the lymphatics, which are basically a sewer system. And it's in the juggling around of those forces that you can explain edema. Now, one form of edema <laughs> that you're very familiar with is what is seen in the uh, acute inflammatory reaction. And Dr. Ramsberg talked about this last <clears throat> summer and fall. And you know that what happens here is uh, perhaps a slight increase of uh, hydraulic pressure because of arterial or dilatation. But the main thing is that the, the capillaries and venules become permeable to proteins. Proteins come out there come out and, and water follows protein, so you have a net flux of water out into the tissues. It's that simple. And that's inflammatory edema. And you know the word exudate. So that kind of uh, inflammatory edema we call an exudate, and that's different from a transudate, which is edema that is fluid that's collecting for some non-inflammatory reason. Exudate versus transudate. Now, 
they'll differ in an exudate fluid. If you just look at the fluid, you know, suck the fluid out of the tissue or got it out of the pleural cavity, for instance, you can have an exudate in the pleural cavity, you can have a transudate. The difference really hinges on the fact that, that an exudate fluid involves this permeability change, so you would expect to find more protein in an exudate, right? In that kind of a fluid. Uh, the specific gravity would be higher. I won't bore you with numbers, but, but it's obviously you've got more protein dissolved in it. It's going to have a higher specific gravity. The, uh, the, there may be a little protein in a transudate, but there are going to be smaller molecules than in the exudate. Uh, exudates frequently contain enough fibrinogen, you know about fibrinogen, that actually you'll have clots of fibrin, uh, strands of fibrin within exudates, and of course you'll also have a variable numbers of inflammatory cells. But it basically it's the amount of protein that's the important difference between exudates and transudates. On the non-inflammatory side, let's forget about exudates now, but talk about things that produce uh, transudates. There are many systemic causes of, of this, and they'll produce uh, more widespread edema. This is important. You've got to distinguish between widespread edema and very localized edema. But uh, systemic causes are important here. With heart failure, you have failure of the right heart, you're going to have a lot of increased back pressure and a lot of increase in hydrostatic pressure here throughout the body. That tends to produce a degree of uh, transfer of, of fluid and, and, and a degree of edema. Another wonderful way of producing generalized uh, problem is by reducing the concentration of plasma protein. And if you have a hypoproteinemia, that is a low enough protein content in the circulating plasma, it's going to screw up the osmotic balance there. There's going to be a tendency not to keep that water sucked in as well, and the hydrostatic forces are going to push out more water. Does that make sense? How do you get hypoproteinemia? Well, one way is by loss through the kidneys. There are, there are various things that happen to the kidney that cause massive proteinuria. In other words, loss of protein into the urine and that can exceed the, the ability of the body to make protein, patient becomes hypoproteinemic and will very often develop anasarca because of it. We refer to that as the nephrotic syndrome. You'll hear that phrase a lot. And so when, some, when you say the patient has nephrotic syndrome, what you better think of is something causing leaking of protein through the kidney to the point of developing hypoproteinemia and edema. Much more rarely, there are such things as protein-losing gastroenteropathies, in other words, diseases of the GI tract that will cause GI loss of protein. They're relatively uncommon, but, but they, they do occur. Uh, another one is uh, famine. I mean, you've all seen uh, these terrible pictures of the pot-bellied kids with ascites in, in, in famine situations. Severe nutritional hypoproteinemia uh, will, will do that. Now, another thing that is very important in terms of a systemic uh, aggravating cause is retention of sodium in the body. I think you're all aware of the fact that, that the water tends to follow salt, and uh, this business of sodium retention becomes very, very important in congestive heart failure. Now, again, we're going to talk about congestive heart failure next week in the MDC. You could read about it a little bit in Robbins. Uh, there, there are a couple of good pages on it. But one of the things that, that happens here is that when the heart fails, tissues throughout the body are, are underperfused. I mentioned that. What this does is trigger a whole bunch of neuroendocrine changes, which we'll talk a little bit about next week. But one of these changes here uh, runs something as follows, it's, and it's important about uh, salt uh, sodium retention. As the left ventricle fails, the kidney is not as well perfused as it ought to be. And there's a sensing mechanism there, which I won't bore you with now, but that senses that, hey, there's not enough blood getting to me, and the kidney produces a substance called renin, which interacts with a, a protein in the blood to produce angiotensin 1, 
This is converted to angiotensin II, and aldosterone secretion is increased because of this. And the net result of all of this is the kidney begins to resorb sodium, to save sodium out of the urine. And, and so sodium tends to pile up in the body, and water follows sodium. Now that sounds a little bit goofy, but that's a very important adaptive mechanism. If you, for instance, if you lose a certain amount of blood volume onto the floor, one quick way to, to reestablish circulating volume is the kidney senses, uh-oh, and triggers in this mechanism and, and uh, uh, water is retained. In heart failure, it's a terrible thing. Because here's a poor old heart failing already, and now the kidney is saving more salt, and more water is being conserved in the body. The blood circulating uh, blood volume goes up, more of a load on the heart, more edema, and so forth. So in heart failure, it's really uh, sort of a, a tussle between the heart and the kidneys. And uh, that's a, one very important neuroendocrine uh, change here. So that, remember that sodium retention is, is a very important uh, factor in uh, aggravating edema formation. What about local causes? I mean, we talk about these systemic causes. Now, there are local causes. If a patient comes in with a swollen arm, you're not going to think about hypoproteinemia if the other arm is normal and the legs are normal and everything. But there are local causes. And uh, increased uh, hydrostatic pressure is, is one. If you, if you block the, the, a vein, uh, significantly, or in the case of such things as a deep uh, th a thrombus, a clot in the deep leg vein, you can, you can block almost the total venous outflow from the extremity and it'll swell. But just one, not both, not, not the face and so forth, localized. So there are localized things like that. And one final point is that if you do something to impair the drainage of the lymphatics, Everything in here can be perfectly normal, but there's enough flux of fluid there that if it isn't draining through the sewer system here, there's going to be gradual edema formed, something we call lymphedema. And you can uh, obstruct lymphatics in a variety of ways. Uh, sometimes the surgeons will destroy the lymphatics in an armpit, taking out lymph nodes, let's say in a breast cancer case, or irradiating that armpit and, and snarling up the, the lymphatics. There are infectious causes. There are parasitic disease called filariasis, where worms get in the lymphatics and they die and they produce an inflammatory reaction and occlude the lymphatics. And this can, can uh, lead to localized uh, edema. Now, the morphology of edema is very straightforward. It's as if you took a syringe and pumped some fluid into the tissues. And microscopically, uh, it's... Um, subtle, I don't expect you to recognize it, but this is a connective tissue that's edematous, and basically these connective tissue fibers normally would have been collapsed together, and here it's being spread out by this pink, uh, pink staining fluid here, that's simply edema. And you can't tell what causes it by looking at it, it's edema. And if you had a tissue like that, it would be swollen. If there was skin over it, the skin would be stretched tight. If you cut it, it would, it would ooze. If you could have a fistful of that and squeeze it, it would just drip. It's, it's just a lot of fluid uh, in, the, in the tissue. Uh, what's interesting about this, well, I'll show you this. This, is a, a, this was a, a drug house ad that I clipped a few years ago. I like it. It shows uh, everybody's grandmother with probably a little bit of congestive failure and edema of the ankles. And uh, this fluid moves around in the interstitium. When, when granny goes to bed at night, the fluid moves elsewhere and wake up in the morning with fairly slender ankles and pretty soon, if you're up and around. The important point for you is that if you have a bedridden patient, you're not as likely to get the edema in the ankles as you are over the sacrum here with someone lying in back look, looking up. So it moves around. And this can be used diagnostically as well. Uh, if you look at a, an ankle like that, you'd say, well, it could be edematous. On the other hand, maybe it's just not a slender, attractive ankle. Uh, 
Uh, and one way to, to settle this, uh, this issue uh, is to try and move some of this around. And the way to do that is press gently, you don't want to go for the bone, press gently on the, on the area, and I'm, that's my thumb, I'm trying to be gentle there, and uh, it squishes a little bit of the fluid away, and then you pull away the thumb, and that's referred to, for obvious reasons, as pitting edema. And that, that means there's a lot of fluid in the area. But that's, that's one way that you can diagnose it quite easily on physical examination. Now, as far as the effects of edema, uh, short term, really not much. Maybe, maybe an edematous waterlogged tissue is a little more susceptible to infection, but, but uh, nothing much. On the other hand, if edema is maintained for long, long periods of time, there can be some permanent changes, and here is a Lollapalooza. This was a, a woman with chronic lymphedema of both lower extremities, and uh, this is a condition that's been referred to for many, many decades as elephantiasis, for obvious reasons. And uh, that's the result of just chronic uh, engorgement uh, by, by lymphedema. Uh, there are a few places where um, having edema on a, just on a mechanical basis can be very, very serious or very, very lethal. I'll show you one and then we'll, we'll let you go and we'll, we'll finish off with this. But the one place that uh, uh, edema can be very important is in the lung. Now, pulmonary edema is very, as pulmonary congestion is very, very common. And because there's no tissue pressure, like there is in, in, in more solid organs, when you get passive congestion of the lung, rather quickly you accumulate edema. And a patient can come in, in the emergency room, let's say with an acute myocardial infarct and some passive congestion of the lung, and edema can develop in minutes. It's just the fluid pouring out of these distended uh, vessels. No permeability change necessary, just a lot of hemodynamic push. And this is edema fluid within the air spaces. And it's obvious that if you get enough edema fluid like this in the air spaces, they're simply going to fill up. If you put a stethoscope on the patient's chest, you're going to hear uh, diminished breath sounds, or you're going to hear air crackling in. These are air bubbles. Patient trying to get air in, and it, gets, it mixes up as, as sort of a froth. And a patient dying in pulmonary edema will just fill up. You've heard the expression death rattle from the secretions that accumulate. And they just fill up, and I've seen them foaming from the, from the mouth and nose. It's just it's drowning uh, in the edema fluid. Uh, short of that, patient can have a certain amount of edema and, and get along, in fact, be breathing okay, but if, if they're in bed in particular and the edema is accumulating, uh, that is a yummy environment for growth of bacteria. And that's, uh, they end up with pneumonia in those edematous areas, something we call a hypostatic pneumonia, meaning, you know, from the fluid settling down, you get it. Just, uh, there is what pulmonary edema looks like on a film, you would, on a chest film, you should have very lucent lungs like that. Uh, this was the before picture. The patient came in and both lung fields were sort of hazy like that and the heart was failing and enlarged. And here when the patient got compensated, there is what the normal looks like. And you can just imagine alveolar spaces full of fluid producing that radiograph. In the autopsy room, it looks like this. You cut across an edematous lung, and just as you'd expect, well, it's congested, but outflows all this bubbly fluid. And you can see why you would hear rowls, those noises, with your stethoscope as the patient is making all that froth uh, during life. Okay, we'll quit here and I'll show you a couple of other examples of bad places for edema when we begin next time.